Hello, welcome back to another episode of Let's Talk About. Today, we are focusing on the prevention and management of gestational diabetes. I'm Karen Lau, a registered dietitian and a certified diabetes care and education specialist at Johnson's Asian American Diabetes Initiative. I provide care for Asian American women with diabetes during pregnancy. Part of my work and passion is to help patients and Asian American community to find joy in eating while staying healthy. Today, I'm going to share with you more about what gestational diabetes is and what are the care for women during and after their pregnancies, as well as the care for future pregnancies. Let's begin and look at what gestational diabetes is. Historically, we said that gestational diabetes is any degree of glucose intolerance that was first recognized during pregnancy. By now, it is defined as diabetes diagnosed in the second or third trimester of pregnancy that was not clearly of first diabetes prior to gestation. Typically, gestational diabetes will go away after the baby is born. However, some women may still see their blood glucose elevated after delivery. And 50% of women who have gestational diabetes may develop type 2 diabetes in 7 to 10 years after they have given birth. Gestational diabetes may also affect the health of the child. The child may have a high risk of obesity and type 2 diabetes later in their lives. So what are the risk factors for gestational diabetes? Women who previously had a history of gestational diabetes or had previously given birth to a child heavier than nine pounds or four kilograms are at a high risk. Having a history of PCOS, impaired fasting glucose tests or impaired oral glucose tolerance test, or in other words, having prediabetes also increases the risk of gestational diabetes. Other non-changeable factors such as having a family history of diabetes Certain ethnic heritage, such as Asian, and increased age will also increase the risk for gestational diabetes. Finally, there are changeable risk factors, which are having overweight or obesity, as well as being physically inactive. Gestational diabetes screening typically is done towards the end of the second trimester and the beginning of third trimester at week 24 to 28 of pregnancy. But for those who are at high risk, they should be screened during the first trimester. During the first trimester, women can be screened by doing a fasting glucose test, A1C test, or a two-hour 75 grams oral glucose tolerance test, or in short, OGTT. If the result is normal, which is fasting less than 110, or A1C less than 5.9%, then the result is considered as normal and they will be screened later at 24 to 28 weeks of pregnancy. If at this first trimester screening, the fasting is between 110 to 125, or A1C between 5.9 to 6.2%, women will begin the treatment as they have gestational diabetes. And for those with fasting higher than 125, A1C above 6.2% or 2 hour 75 grams OGTT with glucose higher than 200, they'll be treated as they have pre-existing diabetes. Now at 24 to 28 weeks, for the rest of the women who have not done the screening test yet, and for those who have had a normal results at this first trimester screening test, they'll be doing a screening test at that time. There are two ways of doing so. The first one is a one-step method, which is a two-hour 75 grams OGTT test. This test will look at the glucose level at fasting, one hour and two hour time points. This test tends to screen and find more people with gestational diabetes. If the readings at fasting is less than 92, at one hour less than 180, and at two hour less than 153, and there is no gestational diabetes. If any of these numbers is not met, then it will be considered as gestational diabetes. The second test is a two-step test. The first step will be doing a 50 grams OGTT test. Patient does not require to come in fasting. 
And they would get the 50 grams glucose drink and then we'll measure the glucose at one hour. If it is less than 140, then the mother is considered as not having gestational diabetes and we're not required to take the second step test. But if the reading is higher than or equals to 140 at one hour, she will need to proceed and do the 100 grams OGTT test. This time, the mother will be required to come in fasting. The fasting reading will be measured and then there will have um, the 100 grams oral glucose drink, and then we'll measure glucose at one, two, and three hour time point. For a normal reading, the fasting is less than 95, one hour is less than 180, two hour is less than 155, and three hour is less than 140. If any of the two readings are at or above goal, it is considered as gestational diabetes. So how many people are at risk? A study published in 2019 looking at data gathered in year 2000, it showed that Asian Americans had a prevalence of 15.5% of gestational diabetes, which is the highest among non-Hispanic whites, non-Hispanic black and Hispanics. And among Asian Americans, Asian Indians had the highest prevalence of nearly 25%. In other words, nearly one in four Asian in Indian women who were pregnant may have gestational diabetes. Shown here are the graphs from a more recent published study. Overall, there is an increasing prevalence of gestational diabetes over the past years among all racial and ethnic groups. And here you can see that non-Hispanic, Asian and Pacific Islanders have the highest gestational diabetes rates when compared to other racial groups. And similarly, this newer data also showed that Asian Indian had the highest gestational diabetes rate among Asian Americans. Although being Asian Americans is a risk factor, there are many things that we can do to prevent and manage gestational diabetes. Now let's take a look at the care during pregnancy. Having regular follow-up with your medical team is important to your care. At Jocelyn, women with gestational diabetes will have a visit with the team every one to four weeks. The care team includes the endocrinologist, who is the diabetes doctor, and diabetes education specialist, who can be a nurse and or a dietitian. We also ask women to keep a log so that they, we can see their changes. They will keep a record of their blood glucose before breakfast and also after they have had their breakfast, lunch, and dinner. They will also make note of the food that they have eaten, particularly foods with carb. They're also asked to check their morning urine ketones, which will give us an idea whether the mother is having adequate nutrients or not. We would like to see as many of the glucose readings and ketones to be at target as possible. So speaking of targets, what are the targets? The table in red has shown the targets we use in managing gestational diabetes at Jocelyn. For most women, we ask them to aim for a fasting glucose at 60 to 95. And for one hour after a meal, we're aiming at 100 to 129. Women with gestational diabetes often have regular ultrasound scan being done. If we see that the fetus has an abdominal circumference at 75th percentile or higher, we will tighten the glucose target. Fasting would then be aiming at 60 to 79 and one hour after meal aiming at 90 to 109. You may notice that our goal may be different from the ones that you used to see in another clinic. In the blue box on the right, I'm showing you the goal suggested by the American Diabetes Association. One of the notable differences is that ADA using, used, uses a one hour post meal goal of 110 to 140. While at Jocelyn, we have a slightly tighter goal of 100 to 129. And also, ADA also uses the two-hour post-meal reading as one of their targets as well. In addition to glucose, the target for morning urine ketones is negative. Healthy eating is one of the important aspects of managing gestational diabetes. When we talk about meal plan for pregnancy, there are few goals that we would like to achieve. 
We want to make sure that there is adequate nutrients for a healthy pregnancy for both the baby and the mother. The meals should provide healthy weight gain. It should also help in minimizing blood glucose fluctuations, while at the same time, can help in avoiding having ketones. And of course, food safety and how to handle changes in appetite or taste will also be important for patients. Besides managing blood glucose, as mentioned, one of the important goals is to ensure healthy weight gain. This chart shows what would the weight gain range be. Weight gain during pregnancy will be based on what weight range the women fall into before pregnancy. Using a BMI that is more suitable for Asian Americans, those with BMI between 18.5 to 22.9, which is considered as the healthy weight range, should aim for gaining 25 to 35 pounds during pregnancy. Specifically, during the second and third trimester, the weight gain should be about one pound per week. For those who are considered as underweight, they should aim for more weight gain, while those who have overweight or obesity should have less weight gain. You may also find it helpful to chart your weight changes during the pregnancy. To achieve the weight gain, how much extra calories do we need? A lot of people thought that they're eating for two, or as soon as they found out that they are pregnant, they should start eating more. But actually, during the first trimester, one does not need extra calories compared to pre-pregnancy. For the second trimester, increase daily caloric intake by 340 calories, which is around the calories for one and a half cup of rice. And in the third trimester, increase daily caloric intake by 452 calories, which is about two cups of rice. So you can see the extra calories is not that much, certainly not eating for two people's portion. While managing glucose, carbohydrates is one of the nutrients that we focus on. Some people may think that when they have gestational diabetes, they should have as little carb as possible. However, carb is one of the very important nutrients that is needed for the baby's growth. Mothers should aim for having at least 175 grams of carb each day. Here is an example of how to spread the 175 grams of carb throughout the day. Looking at the middle column, which is a sample meal plan, usually we have about 30 grams of carb for breakfast and then 45 grams of carb for lunch and dinner each. And in the morning and afternoon, there's a snack of, uh, of 15 to 20 grams of carb each. Before bed, it is also important to have a snack, about 15 to 20, carbs, 20 grams of carb again. On the right-hand column, you sh it shows you how much food would give you those amount of carb. For breakfast, a slice of whole wheat bread and a glass of milk will give you about 30 grams of carb. For lunch and dinner, one cup of brown rice gives you about 45 grams of carb. And for snacks of 15 to 20 grams of carb, it can be an individual size of plain Greek yogurt with a cup of berries to go with it, or a glass of milk, or a five to six slice of, slices of crackers. Of course, the number of crackers that you may have to meet the 15 to 20 grams of carb goal may differ depending on what crackers you're choosing. This is just a meal plan for you to use as a starting point. Work with your dietitian to see what works best for your schedule and your need, which includes how your blood glucose responds to the meals and snacks and how you feel after eating. Is, are you feeling full or are you feeling hungry? All of these do take into account into meal planning. So in the last slide, I've shared with you some samples of foods to meet the carb goal. So what are the foods that have carb? In addition to sugar, most plant-based foods have carb, such as grains and grain products, starchy vegetables, such as potatoes and legumes. There are non-starchy vegetables, such as leafy greens, tomatoes, mushrooms, or eggplants that do not have much carb. And legume products, such as tofu, also do not have much carb. Fruit and fruit juices also have carbs. And another big category of foods that have carb are milk and yogurt. Even though cheese is also a dairy product, they do not have much carb. In addition to spreading the carb throughout the day, there are other meal planning tips that you may want to keep in mind. Incorporate whole grains as much as possible, aiming for at least half of all the grain products to be whole grain. 
Whole grain products have more fiber and generally rises glucose slower. Second, increase non-starchy vegetables intake. You may even want to try starting off a meal by having vegetables. Of course, it would depend on how you feel. If you feel full very soon after eating, starting off with vegetables may not be as feasible for you. Regardless, try to aim for having a ratio of two to one to one of vegetables to carb to protein. When doing this meal planning, try to pair each meal and snack with some protein and moderate amount of fat, or even fiber if you can. For example, pairing them with nuts, cheese, or avocado, and having some crackers or fruits. It also help you in slowing down the spike of blood glucose. Also, avoid liquid carbs such as juice or even congee or other type of porridge in some cases. Another tip is to experiment having foods that you like at different times of the day or with a different amount. You may still able to enjoy the food, but just need to cut back the amount by a little bit. And oftentimes, we see that it is more challenging for you to keep the post-breakfast glucose reading to thin goal. But with the same food that you're eating, you may be able to do all right at lunch or dinner. So instead of completely taking these food out from your meal plan, play around with the timing of the food. For foods that tend to spike up the blood glucose, you may also want to try to incorporate them at a time that you're most physically active. And don't forget, continue to adhere to the general pregnancy nutrition advice and food safety practice. A couple of slides ago, we looked into a sample meal plan of having at least 175 grams of carb. And in the last slide, we talked about adding protein, fat, or maybe some fiber to each meal and snack, and to aim for a two to one to one ratio of vegetables to carb to protein. Combining the carb goal and these additional tips, what will a meal or snack look like? Let's take a look. So for this same meal plan, let's see what we have added to the meal. For breakfast, you may add a fried egg or even some avocado to go with it, then it gives you protein, fat, and fiber. As for the morning snack, it is already quite balanced. Berries give you the carb and the Greek yogurt give you mostly protein or even fat and a little bit of carb. For lunch and dinner, we have one cup of rice and we can add two cups of vegetables and about a palm size of fish to the meals. And for afternoon snack, we have some crackers. You may add cheese to go with it, which gives the protein and fat to the snack. And for evening snack, milk gives you carb and some protein as well. You may further increase the protein amount by adding some nuts to the evening snack. We have spent quite some time looking into healthy eating for gestational diabetes management. Now let's take a quick look at what the recommendations for physical activities are. And this is another very important part in the care for gestational diabetes. Unless contraindicated, women who were previously inactive or active are encouraged to be staying active during pregnancy. Consult your doctor if there's any limit to being active during your pregnancy. Women are encouraged to have moderate activity for 150 minutes each week, or in another words, 30 minutes for most days of the week. One way to help you to build in the physical activity in your daily routine, particularly if you didn't have that habit before pregnancy, is to start by walking for 20 to 30 minutes after each meal. It will help you in lowering the post-meal glucose and may prevent excessive weight gain. Try measuring the change in blood glucose. You may be encouraged and motivated to see how the glucose readings could be lowered by simply walking for 20 to 30 minutes after a meal. In addition to the general care recommendation for gestational diabetes during pregnancy, there are a few additional things to pay attention to during COVID. First of all, it is recommended that women who are pregnant to be vaccinated. If it is time for you to get the booster shot, it is also good to get one. Unvaccinated pregnant women are at a high risk for needing hospital treatment for COVID. Not only does the vaccine protect you, there are some evidence showing that your baby inside you also have the antibodies and a protector from COVID. Keep air flowing and have good ventilation at home whenever possible. Continue to wear a face mask when you are not able to maintain social distance with other people. Keep up with the hand washing and other hygiene and safety measures that you have been practicing. And continue to follow up with your providers and not skip your appointments. 
ask your provider to see if telemedicine is offered to you if you prefer. And don't forget to continue to stay active. Moving around in your home and simply avoid sitting down for an extensive period of time also counts. We've talked about the care during pregnancy. Now let's take a look at the care after the baby is born. Women who had gestational diabetes during pregnancy are at a high risk for having type 2 diabetes in the future. While most women will see their glucose return to the normal level, there are some women who may see their glucose remain above goal. It is very important for women to have a two hour 75 grams oral glucose tolerance test at around six weeks after they have delivered the babies. Oftentimes when women have, who have a normal OGTT result at that time, they may think the risks are completely gone. It is important to know that 50% of women who had gestational diabetes develop type two diabetes in the following seven to 10 years. Therefore, it is important to adopt healthy lifestyle to prevent or delay the development of type two diabetes. Aim to lose the weight that you have gained during pregnancy and maintain a healthy weight. If you have overweight or obesity, lose about five to 7% of the body weight. Continue to stay active and eat healthy. It is encouraged to breastfeed your baby. Studies have shown that it may help in lowering the risk of future type 2 diabetes. It is recommended to have exclusive breastfeeding for the first six months of the baby's life. Also remember to have regular follow-up that includes diabetes screening. Last but not least, also discuss preconception plan with your provider so that you will be ready for future pregnancies with well-managed glucose and healthy lifestyle. Now let's take a look at how much nutrition do we need for a woman who is breastfeeding for the first 12 months after delivery. Her calories need among women who had a healthy pre-pregnancy weight during the first six months after delivery have an additional 330 calories per day compared to the pre-pregnancy need. This amount of calories is calculated based on the need for breastfeeding as well as for the assisting weight loss. In the second six months, it will be additional 400 calories per day. As for carbohydrates, it is re recommended to have at least 210 grams per day. And protein need for each day is about 1.1 to 1.3 grams per kilograms of body weight. We can see that it is quite similar to what you eat during pregnancy, but with a little more carb. But let's go back to the meal plan that we saw. Simply by adding 15 grams of carb each to breakfast, lunch, and dinner, it will meet the goal. That means you can have an additional slice of bread for breakfast and about one third cup more of rice to lunch and dinner each. And lastly, let's take a look at what you can do to prepare for a healthy pregnancy in the future. It is important to provide care during and after pregnancy it is equally important to prepare for a pregnancy for those who had gestational diabetes before. Discuss about your plan for future pregnancies with your healthcare provider early on. Maintain a near normal blood glucose, especially if your glucose did not return to normal range after the previous pregnancy. Lifestyle management continues to be very important. Keep up with the healthy eating, continue to stay active, stop smoking and drinking. And if you are on any medications, consult with your doctors to see if any changes will be needed. As part of preconception care and routine, take a multivitamin that contains at least 400 micrograms of folic acid each day. And finally, maintain a healthy weight. Lose five to 10% of your body weight if you have overweight or obesity. When talking about pregnancy and preconception, oftentimes we focus on the care for women. But we know that it is also very important for preconception care for men as well. Invite them to join you in the preconception session with your doctor next time. Encourage them to quit smoking if they're smoking and also ask them to avoid excessive drinking. Avoid using recreational drugs, certain medications and exposure to toxic substances. It is also very important for men to maintain a healthy blood glucose and blood pressure as well. Having a healthy weight is also very important. This can be achieved through healthy eating and staying active. So the healthy lifestyle that the woman has adopted are also very important for the men. 
Finally, a reminder for a healthy and successful pregnancy, it starts before a woman become pregnant. Healthy lifestyle and other preconception care are important for both men and women. And care after a baby is delivered is equally important. I hope this session has provided you with helpful information for you to provide better care for yourself as well as for people who you care about. And you may find more information on our website. If there are any questions, you may reach us by email or phone. Thank you.